But I'm willing to believe that even if it's extremely rare, it's still lots of life in our galaxy. Okay? But as I say, the problem is, will we ever know about it? And that's not so clear. Because, you know, I just want to give you an example of the problem. So let's say you're, you're on this star here and someone tells you to look right there at that sun and look at the third rock from that sun. Okay? You'll find life. Well, even then, you'd have a very small probability of finding life on Earth. Because our sun is four and a half billion years old. Most of the stars in our galaxy are far older. So you could have been an intelligent civilization watching the Earth from the time it formed to today, four and a half billion years later. But only during the last 50 years have we been emitting signals which in principle could give evidence that there's intelligent life. I mean, I love Lucy, Star Trek, etc. <laughs> and so if you think about that, even if you knew exactly where to look and what channel to listen to, You'd only have a, a 1 in 50 million chance of finding life on Earth, even if you knew exactly where to look and what to listen to. We don't know where to look or what to listen to. But we're doing it, okay? And in fact, uh, there, I have a nice, one of the first SETI uh, uh, experiments. This was at the Harvard Radio Observatory in Harvard, Massachusetts. And this is uh, uh, the son of a former colleague of mine when I was at Harvard, Paul Horowitz, his son. And this was used by Paul and his colleague, Carl Sagan, to launch one of the first SETI experiments. This was um, designed, it was going to run for five years to listen for the signal of extraterrestrials. Actually, it only went on for three years. Congress, in their wisdom, cut off funding. But then Steven Spielberg, who's richer than the US government, uh, 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 funded it. And it, it went on for five years. And, and, it, and they went on for five years, and they listened for extraterrestrials. Now, what would they listen for? Well, of course, the answer to everything is in Star Trek. So let's go to Star Trek and see. <laughs> we want to just look at that for a while. That's pretty fun. OK. There he goes. He's shop eyes, too. Okay, so are we. Now, um, in this case, uh, the, the writers cribbed, in this case from some very famous astrophysicist, who said, look, if you want to listen for a signal for extraterrestrials, listen for prime numbers. And that's what Jody Foster listened to in contact. Because rarely would you expect random radio storms on some star to produce the first six prime numbers over and over again. And, um, and so, but, but they couldn't do that. Um, at the time uh, when this ex original experiment was created, um, uh, Paul and, and Carl couldn't do that and, uh, because they didn't have the computer power. Let's go back here. They developed it, and the problem is, remember, you want to listen for a signal, but you don't know what channel to listen to. So they developed a device that would listen to a million different frequencies at the same time. Okay, and it doesn't look very fancy now. But it was. But the computer power was such that you couldn't listen to a million different frequencies at the same time and listen for six prime numbers or, or ten or whatever. So they just listened for a signal that went on and off and on and off at regular rates. They listened for five years. They didn't hear anything. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that there are no extraterrestrials out there. Maybe they're listening for the wrong signal. Maybe they're listening to the wrong million channels. Maybe the signal is weaker than this uh, antenna could have detected. There are lots of possibilities. So they built, actually, in this experiment, they built a better detector, or as they call it Boston, a beta detector. Um, there it is, B-E-T-A. Um, <laughs> that, that, that stands for Billion Channel Extraterrestrial Assay. And this could listen to a billion different frequencies at the same time, a thousand times more. And, and experiments like this, or more sophisticated ones that are now going on, are the way, I'm convinced, if we're ever going to know about extraterrestrial life, it won't be by traveling through spacecraft at the speed of light or warp drive and going around the galaxy in, in starships. It's going to be listening for these signals. And maybe we'll hear them one day. Now, it may depress you to think that that's the way we're going to discover life elsewhere, by sitting here and listening instead of going out. But again, I want to, you know, Star Trek has that theme too. I want to show you so you won't feel so depressed. Yes, sir. The Siberians are exploring the galaxy. 
privacy just as we are. The only difference is that they never leave their home. They bring others here. Their only wish, an exchange of knowledge. They want to know us. So now, in this episode, which I love this episode, because in this episode, Lieutenant Barkley gets intelligent for one hour, and it's really <laughs> kind of neat. But, uh, but anyway, uh, in this episode, the Cytherians, um, you know, they're a race that, that learns about the universe by bringing everyone to them and not traveling around. Now, that's exactly what we're doing with our radio telescopes and the Hubble Space Telescope and our particle accelerators. The first moments of the Big Bang and learn about the universe out to the farthest reaches of the visible universe, billions of light years away, without ever leaving our home. Now, that would be a wonderful way to end this lecture, which is why I won't end the lecture that way. Because I want to end it on a slightly different note. I want to show you three bloopers in quick succession, because it allowed me to end on a slightly different note. So I want to show you one from each of the series. And uh, the first one I want to show you is from the classic series, it, an episode called In the Wink of an Eye. And um, in this episode, there's this, this race um, that, ha that they have a very fast metabolic rate. They move so fast you can't even see them. Okay? And they have this queen, Queen Dila, and she needs a mate. So who does she choose? Okay. James T. Kirk, of course. And they give him a little water from their say, and he speeds up to their rate. And in this episode, actually, they did mate. They got to pass the centers like they did a lot of stuff. But before they mate, he tries to kill her. Uh, th now, uh, uh, now, now, that's not the blooper, although in real life it always works the other way around. But, but, uh, um, but uh, well, he doesn't try to kill her, he tries to stun her, so watch what happens. Maybe watch what happens. Okay, here we go. Okay, what's wrong with that picture? Well, again, everything. Um, it's, it's really simple. Okay, so he's, um, he's trying to shoot her, and he's shooting with a phaser beam, which is a directed energy weapon, which means this beam travels at the speed of light. So how does she know he's pulled the trigger? Well, she sees him pull the trigger, but by the time she sees him pull the trigger, she's been hit. Okay, nothing to do with special relativity here, right? Just that you just can't outrun a light beam because you, you got to see it to outrun it, okay? And so it's, I, did, I wanted to warm you up. I wanted to do something quite simple at the beginning. So that's, that's, that's the first blooper. Now, the next blooper actually is one, is, is one of my favorites. I call it, it involves an error call, that I call the ghost error. And I refer here to a movie that some people liked called Ghost. Um, I didn't. Um, <laughs> Uh, I didn't because it was stupid. And, uh, and, and, and here's the reason it's stupid. You know, it's, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but it involves this young couple, and the guy dies. He's a ghost, and he wants to prove to her that he's around, and, and he tries to embrace her, but his hands go right through her. You know? He tries to pick up a penny, but he can't even pick up the penny. It's, it's tragic. But the problem is, every time he sits on a chair, he sits on the chair, okay? Every time he walks the floor, he walks the floor. So somehow his butt or his feet have some incredible abilities that his, that his hands don't have. And that's what did it for me. I lost it there. Now, that, that, um, that error happens a lot. It happens in Star Trek. This is an episode from The Next Generation called Out of Phase, in which Geordi and Roe get, get put out of phase with normal matter and they can walk through walls and stuff. So let's watch a little bit of it. <laughs> 